Thanks so much, uh, Natalie. I am so privileged to be here today with my friends, Autumn and Ashana. We met in New York City at the BitDevs meetup. By the way, shout out to the incredible organizers of all the Bitcoin developer meetups around the world. And I was blown away. I was like, who are you? And what are you doing in Bitcoin? This is incredible. So we became friends. I learned more about their work. I saw them give a talk last week in New York City about their new project that we'll hear a little bit about. And then we'll go to a fireside with me. So first, I'd love to hear a little bit about how you both got interested in Bitcoin. Uh, so at the beginning, or at the end of 2020, uh, my dad got into Bitcoin and he just wouldn't stop talking about it and to the point Familiar where I was like, thing. please, I've had enough, you know, but um, then out of last year in August, I uh, went to the Austin Bit Devs meetup and I'm really interested in UX design. So I met the UX designer for Unchained Capital and I really saw how UX and Bitcoin uh, can collaborate and help create this space. And so from there, I've just been a nerd and just wanted to learn more and get more. We are all nerds in Bitcoin. <laughs> Ashana. Yeah, so um, I read the Bitcoin standard in the summer of 2020. Shout out to Safe. <laughs> um, and I got really interested in the more technical side of Bitcoin and started learning about it by reading Mastering Bitcoin. So shout out to Andreas. Um, and I um, wanted to you know, figure out how to start writing code for Bitcoin, which is not a really straightforward thing to do. So somehow I ended up at a BitDevs meetup and that's where Autumn and I met. Amazing. Um, and you've both been contributing to Bitcoin, so tell me what you've contributed. Yeah, so right now I am a content creator and UI UX designer for uh, Ladies in Bitcoin, uh, founded by Sarah Satoshi. Um, and I have also, uh, Ashana has been working on a testnet wallet, so uh, I have designed the UX for that on Figma. And, uh, and then I co-founded Generation Bitcoin. Amazing. Yeah, so. Um, as Autumn mentioned, I've been working on a testnet wallet since, I think, January. Uh, it's been really a fun project to work on. And I've also been trying to sort of get familiar with Bitcoin Core. So I actually committed a test case to Bitcoin Core, which was merged just last week. So the youngest known contributor to Bitcoin Core right here. Don't we all wish we were like Ashana when we were 14 and Autumn when we were 17? And you've also, you're running a lightning node? Yeah, yeah. So um, we were actually gifted a lightning node uh, last week at the BitDevs meetup. So uh, huge thanks to you know, the organizers for that. And yeah, so we've been running uh, LND. All right, and you founded this group called Generation Bitcoin, which I learned a lot about last week. Quickly, tell us about what you're doing there. Yeah, so uh, Generation Bitcoin is a community focused on kind of supporting teens to learn about Bitcoin and like dive down their own rabbit holes. And so how we do that is uh, we decide on resources we read, then we meet up at weekly meetings, and then uh, from there we have uh, peer-led uh, presentations, like if you are interested in privacy or, or mining, you're totally welcome to do a presentation on that. And and then in the near future, we've gotten a lot of support, so speakers have, will come and, and talk to us about topics, like certain topics. How many people here in the room either themselves or have kids that want to get involved in this group? Raise your hands. Okay. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. How do people get involved? Yeah, so the, we have a website in progress right now, but as of now, the best way to learn more about us is to go on Twitter, and we're at genbitcoin underscore, and we have a form that you can fill out if you're interested in joining, uh, but we also just post threads about our meetings and stuff that we're doing, so you can go check us out there. Incredible. All right, well, now I'm going to pass it to the two of you uh, to ask me a few questions. Yeah, so we were curious as to what a Bitcoinized world would look like in your opinion and what role Lightning would play in that. So I like to create memes. Um, number of people go up, Bitcoin for billions, not billionaires. And I was thinking recently, 
you hear the word dollarize and it's a verb. And we think about hyper-Bitcoinization, but why haven't we yet made Bitcoinize a verb? So I've decided I'm on a path to make Bitcoinize a verb and really have it ubiquitous globally around the world. And I'm founder and CEO of Lightning Labs and huge shout out to the entire you know, Bitcoin Lightning community, the passion in this world. And to me, what this means is giving access to people globally, getting this technology out there, enabling people to use it, and bringing financial freedom to the world. This is something that I deeply care about. I know everyone here also cares about that. But in a Bitcoinized world, I believe we'll have a scenario where people have access to financial services. They don't need to pay extremely high fees or you know, banks or credit card processors you know, taking massive amounts. They don't have to deal with issues like hyperinflation or authoritarian governments taking away their money. They can seamlessly embed and send money on the internet, both enabling use cases that weren't previously possible, like many of the things that the Lightning community has developed, and access for those who previously didn't have it. So we've already seen, even in the last year, so much of this Bitcoinization. And the goal really in the future is, with Lightning as a layer two open protocol with instant high volume transactions with low fees, we're going to make this technology ubiquitous like the internet of money, right? What the internet did for access to knowledge and information, Bitcoin and Lightning are doing for access to financial services and for freedom money. Awesome. Yeah, so another question I had. So I've heard about like the four phases of money, right? You have the store of value, then you have the medium of exchange, then you have the unit of account, and then the global reserve currency. And so my question was, uh, does the implication of the Lightning Network mean that we are making that shift into the next phase, which is um, medium of exchange? So we hear a lot about the concept of number go up. And in reaction to that, and actually at the beginning of 2021, where there was a lot of frenzy and hype, I personally got quite frustrated when my goal is really to bring this to billions. Talked about this last year at the conference with the incredible Lynn Alden. Shout out to Lynn and her wonderful macro research. And she's amazing. And from my standpoint, the idea that Bitcoin is solely a digital rock is outmoded, right? We actually heard yesterday at the conference from Peter Thiel who said, Bitcoin can't be high velocity. You know, Bitcoin is merely a store of value. Someone needs to tell him about Lightning. Happy to do so if he wants to learn, right? So clearly with Lightning, the idea is it's transactional. It enables people to send and receive. It opens up access to people globally. It's interoperable. We heard yesterday from Jack Mullers about the great work he's doing with Strike and getting this embedded in payment processors. So. The idea that Bitcoin is merely a store of value is completely outmoded, outdated. We had Bitcoin the asset at the beginning. Now we have Bitcoin the monetary network. And you mentioned global reserve currency. Well, we're very much headed in that direction. And that is what you know, Bitcoinizing the world means. But it's not merely for a store of value. It's going to be this medium of exchange and this way for people to transact globally. So we've seen a huge amount of progress even in the last year. And it's really only the beginning. Awesome. Yeah, so uh, when I t tell my friends that you know, I'm interested in Bitcoin, I usually hear, oh, what about XYZ other cryptocurrency? Uh, I'm sure we all have. But I was curious as to what sets Bitcoin and Lightning apart from this world of crypto. Definitely. There's a lot out there these days. And I think there are so many qualities that set Bitcoin apart. So first of all, Bitcoin is the most secure cryptocurrency. It has the most users. It has a massive network effect. It has the most hash power, you know, backing it up. It has the most liquidity, right? But as a community, we are so passionate. The amount of just people that love this, that spend their nights and weekends. So for example, here at the conference, we have Andy Schroeder, the engineer who integrated Lightning into his Tesla. He was so passionate about it that he actually reverse engineered, bought a Tesla, reverse engineered it, and you can actually see it this year here in the exhibition hall. It's that kind of passion that I think really sets our community apart. So first of all, shout out to the community and all the builders and the makers and people that are just doing this because they love it. We also have people that deeply care about you know, the global implications, the human rights implications, the Human Rights Foundation, incredible people globally. This is not 
something that's merely in the US. It's not just in Silicon Valley. It's not just in New York. This is a global technology. And importantly, um, Bitcoin and Lightning have what Lynn Alden, again, my friend, calls a high utility to speculation ratio. We see a lot of other things out there where it's basically just gambling, frankly. There's a lot of speculation, and it's tokens upon tokens upon tokens. With Bitcoin and Lightning, we really care about solving real problems for real people, making this technology accessible, and finding these use cases around the world. And therefore, the utility is much higher than the speculation, which means the global impact for what we're building has far more potential to be the decentralized money of the world. And that's really what sets us apart as well. That's awesome. That, that last, your answer to the last question kind of leads into my next question, which is, what are the global implications um, and use cases around the world for Lightning Network? Yeah, so sometimes people in the US say, well, you know, I have a credit card, I have a bank account, and why do I need this technology? Well, as it turns out, there are many people, billions globally, that don't have access to this financial system, and frankly, they should have something better. They should have something that's faster, that's cheaper, that's more interoperable. So what really, you know, the implications here are that this technology can be used around the world. And in the Bitcoin and Lightning community, we have incredible entrepreneurs in places like El Salvador. And by the way, you know, the pioneering country making Bitcoin legal tender. Shout out to El Salvador. <laughs> Guatemala, Argentina, Brazil, Ghana, Nigeria, Vietnam all of these emerging markets, there's something really key about the emerging markets, right? So in a place like El Salvador, maybe 20 to 30% of the population has a bank account. But how many people have mobile phones? The vast majority. Nigeria is a country where 70% of the population is 30 or under. My co-founder, Lalu, the brilliant technical mind, goes by roast beef on the internet, is Nigerian American. He has family there, he talks to them. This is a digital population. These are people that want native internet money on their phone, and they don't need a bank account, right? And they can leapfrog over the legacy financial system, which is outmoded, which charges super high fees, and use the future and have access to it. So last fall, I was here in Miami at the Oslo Freedom Farm, which was held in Miami by the Human Rights Foundation. Met an incredible human rights activist and DJ named DJ Switch, and she's from Nigeria. She, on her mobile phone, recorded this crackdown on protesters in Nigeria. She had to leave the country. The government was going after her. She came to the US, and the government tried to shut down her bank accounts. Now, in the US, you know, this doesn't happen as much, but we've even seen this happening in Canada and elsewhere. It's closer to home. And we told her about Bitcoin, and she said, okay, this sounds really interesting. How do I get involved? So my colleague, uh, Jacob, on my team said, okay, get your phone out. Got her on a Lightning wallet, shout out to the Moon, the developers, and instantaneously just sent her like $10 worth of Bitcoin over Lightning. And she stared at her phone and she said, oh my God. And we were like, oh, what? She said, oh my God, I didn't have to open an account. The government cannot take this away from me. And that really inspired me because what I realized is you have to show people the power of this technology. They need to see it visually to understand how powerful this is. And for everyone like the incredible DJ Switch, by the way, she's also an amazing DJ, check out her Instagram. This opens up access for people globally so much where the legacy system just cannot do so and we're giving them something far superior um, with far greater access that's really gonna open up many opportunities. Yeah, so yesterday, Autumn and I got the amazing opportunity to meet Roast Beef, who, as you guys Man, probably know, the myth, the legend. <laughs> uh, has been working on Tarot. And we talked about how it works, some of the use cases, and we wanted to ask you what the significance of having stable coins on the Lightning Network is. So, as mentioned at Lightning Labs, we uh, have been working on a proposal for the Bitcoin community in the form of a, a BIP a Bitcoin improvement proposal, um, to issue assets over Bitcoin and Lightning. And first of all, we deeply believe in Bitcoin and we believe this will help the future of Bitcoin. We put it out to the world, there's a technical specification, we're soliciting feedback. Thank you, by the way, to all the developers that have already reviewed and commented. And importantly, it uses Taproot, the recent upgrade to Bitcoin. And when Taproot activated in November, I think you know it adds greater privacy, which is great. It adds uh, contracting functionality, it adds 
uh, some degree of efficiency to Bitcoin, but people were wondering, what exactly is Taproot going to do? And it actually uses the tree structure from Taproot to be able to issue assets, which so opens up this whole new world. But we deeply believe this is good for Bitcoin, and here's why. So in emerging markets, and Alex Gladstein has been working on this and has actually a bounty about the ability to have Bitcoin uh, native and backed stable coins. Sometimes people want the stability of fiat. They might be in hyperinflationary environments. But it also makes it really easy to Bitcoinize people, right? Because let's say you're in an emerging market, maybe El Salvador, and you have dollars in your wallet. But you know, as we see today, there's here in the US something like 8, 10% inflation you know, on the books, but it's actually far greater, right? So now you can seamlessly go between, say, a USD stablecoin and Bitcoin, which is key. And importantly, it uses the stability and security of the underlying Bitcoin blockchain, but then you can move the assets onto Lightning to enable the instant high volume transactions with low fees. And today you see things like stablecoins on other chains, and some of them go down for like 18 hours at a time. You know, other ones have extremely high fees. Well, guess what? Bitcoin doesn't go down and Lightning does not go down. Bitcoin is like 99.99% uptime, you know, over 50,000 nodes, according to Luke Jr. Lightning has over 33,000. And this is, by the way, the most secure, the most decentralized, and the most stable global monetary network. So the goal here is, well, we believe in Bitcoin as a power of a global monetary network. It's the internet of money. It enables you to natively embed value. You know, the way that you send a photo on the internet today, you should be able to embed value with Bitcoin and Lightning. But what if all, say, the world's currencies actually use the security of Bitcoin, but importantly, routed through Bitcoin over the Lightning network? That's awesome. Um, my next question kind of has to do with, I'm still understanding what Lightning is and how it works and what Tarot is and how it works. And so I was wondering if you can kind of go into what's the difference between transferring Satoshis through the Lightning Network and uh, what's the difference between um, how you would transfer Satoshis through the Tarot? Definitely. Um, so it's funny, sometimes people say like, oh, is there a Lightning token? And as I have tweeted, the official token of Lightning is called SATS. And you should, you should sta stack some of those SATS. Um, so, and credit to Lalo for this brilliant design. But the way that we, we're thinking about it is, you shouldn't have complexity in the network. This is actually a technology where you have it on the edges, much like the principles of the internet, where you move the complexity to the edges and you keep the middle, if you will, of the network simple. So it actually interoperates with the broader Lightning Network. And the way that it works is you might have like Alice, Bob, Carol, you know, Dave, Aaron, Fred. The, you know, Alice and Fred know about, say, like a USD stablecoin or a peso stablecoin or whatever else, yen, euro. But all the nodes in between are only sending and receiving Bitcoin. So you're actually going from dollar to Bitcoin back to dollar. And it's all atomic, so it basically either goes through or you know, it, it doesn't and it's instant and you have these conversion nodes. But what I think is significant here is Bitcoin becomes the global currency and asset of interoperability for all of the other currencies. And the more liquidity in terms of Bitcoin that you have in the Lightning Network, the more you can send and receive these assets. And it's not like the idea that you only send through a dollar channel or only send through a Euro channel or a Yen channel. No, it's all Bitcoin. Because what Bitcoin actually does is, it's this glue, if you will, that is able to connect all these other currencies, and we're building out a protocol with feedback from the community. You know, it's fully open. Whoever wants to integrate it can to really make Bitcoin not only the global reserve currency, but the global transactional currency that everything else will be built on top of. So sort of playing on that theme of future development and just to zoom out a bit, what are you most excited for about the future of this technology? Well, first of all, I'm excited about both of you as future leaders in this space. So thank you for joining me on stage. <laughs> Truly Generation Bitcoin right here. So this community is so incredible. I know we heard Kathy Wood and Michael Saylor on stage yesterday talking about the explosion of development in the Lightning world. And first of all, 
I am floored every day learning about what this community has developed and what people are building. There's so much creativity. You know, there's everything from very importantly cross-border payments, streaming Satoshis for the creator economy. Um, you have gaming, which is really big. There, for example, in Brazil, you know, Lightning Gaming is huge. People are earning more than they would, would in their annual income by playing video games, right? Video games is a career, if you will. Um, you have people building a variety of payment apps. You have people building, trading all of this. And it's, the possibilities are endless, right? With the new protocol we've been working on, you can do really interesting new future use cases, but also with the principles of Bitcoin, right? So what you see in some other protocols is they take a move fast and break things approach, right? And then you see $600 million hacks. Well, that is not how Bitcoin operates, right? Bitcoin cares deeply about decentralization and security as it should. And the way that, say, the core development community, and so grateful for all of their hard work, operates is, I think of it as proceed cautiously and build a secure base layer because at the end of the day, when you have the global network effect of decentralized money, you need that to be secure. And then you look on layer two as lightning and you have that abstraction, you can build more complex things on layer two without sacrificing the security of the underlying base layer. So for me, I mean, first of all, there's so many exciting proposals for the protocol. Um, for example, uh, shout out to Christian Decker and the folks at Blockstream working on things like channel factories where you can onboard many people in one on-chain on -chain transaction onto Lightning. We have really interesting protocol enhancements like uh, PTLCs, which actually uh, enable scalability and enable Schnorr signatures to be used um, over Lightning and some benefits compared to the existing way that you send transfers on there. Um, we have new routing functionality. And we also just have a whole host of applications that many of us haven't even envisioned yet. So for me, you know, this talent is global. We see entrepreneurs all around the world. We see, oh, Alex Gladstein uh, today also announced with the Human Rights Foundation that they're actually giving away SATs, you know, the native token of Bitcoin, uh, to people globally that want to onboard to Lightning. So I'm excited about getting more people on board, getting them excited, Bitcoinizing the world, and just enabling this explosion of developer talent in terms of the future of what people are building, because we've made a lot of progress thus far, nation state level adoption, you know, Twitter is integrated in it. We saw major players like Kraken and Robin, but to me, it's really just the beginning. And uh, I wrote uh, two years ago that this is the decade of lightning, and it's been uh, quite a two years thus far. Well, thank you so much for for inviting us up here. It was an amazing opportunity to be in front of you and talk to all of you and, and get to know you more. And so thank you so much. Oh, right. <clears throat> so being a young person in this space, I kind of was just wondering, what are the best ways for young people like me and Ashana um, to be interested in, like introduced into Bitcoin and the Lightning Network? So first of all, and we heard this from like Novogratz, Get involved, right? Bitcoin doesn't care. Bitcoin doesn't care if you're 14 or 80. You know, Bitcoin doesn't care where you live around the world. Um, you know, we talk about Bitcoin being the honey, ba honey badger of money. Honey badger don't care. And there's such a huge opportunity. You can be five years old and own Bitcoin. You can be 85 years old and own Bitcoin, right? There's no requirement. So what you can do is get involved, learn more about it, educate it, contribute. And also for all those out there, Join Generation Bitcoin because you are the future. Uh, thank you so much. This has been amazing. And welcome to the future of Bitcoin. Thank you. Thank you. We are back with the Bitcoin Magazine coverage of Bitcoin 22 at the Marathon Live Desk. We are very lucky. <laughs> Marathon it, Very baby. lucky to have Marathon Stacey it. Herbert and Max Kaiser with us. Y'all had some trouble at the door. I know you want to talk about oh, it. Oh, yeah, so we were sorry. trying to get in over there, and we couldn't get in. There's a very large man was picking me up and saying, you can't come in. <laughs> no, this was, turned into like the Oscars, man. It was like the Oscars. I had to say, go all Will Smith on his ass. <laughs> and then, you know, all hell broke loose. Did then you this young lady Island? saved me. This beautiful woman in the white dress came in and plucked me out of the melee. 
she brought me inside to this desk, and here I am to tell the story. And it was all over a woman, just like the Oscars, because I wouldn't wear, I didn't want to put this on my wrist. I had it around my neck. And so they beat Max, they literally beat Max up. They were like all, all up in my ass and shit. Did I, you hit them back? I, yeah, I'm, I'm safe, though, because I have Bitcoin to protect me. Bitcoin is a shield. We got the rockets of the IMF. We got the ballistic missiles of the central banks. We got the Jamie Diamonds of the world. We got all those shit posters trying to attack Bitcoin, but we got the ultimate shield against them all. We're going to win, and we're winning right now. Okay, so going back to the panel, we just watched, some of us just watched <laughs> Elizabeth Stark <laughs> discussing Bitcoinizing the world via lightning, one of the key topics was this idea of leapfrogging, right? The global south, they don't have this payments infrastructure, the Visa, the MasterCard, all these things that we have that we think is great. It might be holding us back. Let's talk about leapfrogging. Stacey, I want to start with you. Well, if you've been to Bitcoin Beach, you've seen what leapfrogging looks like. So... Bitcoin Beach is a small community in El Salvador that had no banking infrastructure, no financial services available to anybody there. There was no ATM. There were no credit cards, bank accounts for any of the small businesses in the area. So what you saw is uh, they leapfrogged that entire legacy system and it's hyper Bitcoinized. Yeah. And I heard that Bitcoins uh, that yeah that in El Salvador, the um the influx of people that are traveling there is up 70% since the last announcement. I mean, so that's tourism. huge. Yeah, that, tourism's you, up 30% in El Salvador, Salvador. and uh, the economy is growing. And before the Bitcoin was made legal tender, 70% of the population was unbanked. Now 70% of the population is essentially banked. So they flipped with the one act of... of Who the government. heck is holding out? Uh, you know, a few stragglers, they'll come on board. And uh, now you've got a country that's fully on board, fully up. So Elizabeth Stark is correct in talking about how countries around the world can leapfrog, right? So they don't need the formal banking infrastructure. They don't need any relationships with any of the current banking folks. And they can just go right into having their own bank and being their own banker. So she's absolutely correct. Lightning's a huge part of that. And uh, lightning payments are huge. And so she's absolutely correct. And that's what we're seeing. So... Elizabeth talked about kind of like this conflict between just hodl your Bitcoin mm. and then the fact that, you know, Bitcoin is such a powerful thing to use, right? What What's this contradiction between hodl spending and using Bitcoin? Erica, let's start with you and then go down the line. I feel like hodl is a mindset in the United States where we have a currency that's relatively stable. But when she's talking about these emerging nations leapfrogging as uh, with their financial system, they actually need to spend their money. And so it's just this different in mindset because of where you live in the world. Right. Well, Bitcoin is store of value and hodling is the use case that made Bitcoin what it is. And its use as medium of exchange will increase. I think we'll see a lot more <laughs> at a higher price, 1000 200000 a coin when people start spending their Bitcoin to buy cars and houses and things like that. But for now, it's OK to be using Bitcoin as a store of value. And the use case as a medium of exchange through Lightning is developing quite rapidly as well. But people are still going to hodl as long as every other asset in the world is going to underperform Bitcoin. Bitcoin will still be the best performing asset of all assets out there. So it's going to be hodled. It's going to be hodled. Stacey. Uh, of course, those of us who maybe, you know, spent some Bitcoin when it first went up to like 100 bucks and you're like, whoa, look, I could buy an iPhone with 10 Bitcoin. Oh. You know, <laughs> it's as much PTSD causing as like going through your security gates here with a whale pass. And uh, <laughs> no, so I, I think that's part of it, perhaps by the hodl, because everybody's gone through that uh, thing of spending Bitcoin too soon. But we, we spend a lot when we're in El Salvador. D does it hurt when you spend or does no because i'm always stacking so it's kind of like net net i'm i'm net stacking that despite anything i'm spending i'm still stacking more than i'm spending do you, i guess like in terms of hyper bitcoinizing does going 100 percent bitcoin getting on zero if you will do you recommend it each of you what to, uh let's start with stacy but each of you give me your take get on zero do you recommend it uh, that's how I operate. <laughs> I recommend everybody else, unless your risk tolerance is higher and you're willing to uh, lose all your purchasing power. Well, Michael Saylor, uh, Ricardo Salena said he's 60% now in Bitcoin. And I said, well, you're short. You know, you need to take an aggressive position. You know, be like Michael Saylor, be 150% Bitcoin. Yeah, all I right, think if you, if you can afford it, then you should do it. 